All right, why don't we uh, get started now? Hi, welcome. I'm Marty. This is CS193A. Let's just get right to the thing you really want to know. Are the lectures on video? I know. Uh, I sort of. The answer is sort of. I run screen recording software on my laptop during the lecture. So in theory, the answer to the question is yes. I will record the lecture, and then after class, I upload it to YouTube, and I post a link on the website, so there's a video. But two problems. One is this is a piece of shit video <laughs> because I, it doesn't capture the room or me or anything I draw on the board. It's just capturing my screen, and the audio is it's capturing the like microphone built into my laptop. So the audio is kind of tinny and kind of hard to hear. If I step over there, which if you're watching this on later, you'll see, you'll hear this. Like, if I stand over here, you don't really hear me very well. So, like, this is all I'm willing to do. <laughs> I, I will tell my laptop to record, and then at the end, I will upload it. I'm not going to edit it or fix it or anything. So, basically, there will be videos, but they're not going to be, like, awesome quality videos. So, uh, and also, occasionally, my computer crashes during lecture. And if that happens, I just lose the video. So every time I've ever taught the course, there's been at least one lecture where the video is lost. So like, are there videos? Sort of. Sort of, you know? Mostly, yes. But um, that's kind of the best I can do. Um, I'll post them, and you can watch them if you like. But you know, in my opinion, they're more useful as a supplement. Like, if you didn't understand something, you can go back and look at them. Uh, anyway, yeah, this is CS193A. I'm Marty Stepp. I'm an instructor. Uh, this is our class website. I didn't bring you any pieces of paper today. Like, there's a course information handout on this website that you might want to look at, but I didn't print it out for you because I just I don't print anything for for this class. So um, you can go look at it on your computer later. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about what this course is, what the goals are, and I'm going to teach you a little bit. We're going to hopefully write a little mini Android app by the end of class today. We have these really long lectures, so hopefully we can get that done. Um, I know another question a lot of you might have is like. What if I'm uh, uh, not officially in the class right now? What if I uh, am on a waiting list or enrolled or uh, filled out an application and I haven't heard back or something like that? Um, I would say most of such people will not be able to get in the class because um, I have hired all of the CAs I can hire and I can't get any more. And if I take more students, it just overloads the CAs with too much grading. So uh, basically, if you have not get, been given some sort of ad code yet from me, then you're on a wait list. And like, I can only let you in if people drop. So what the best I can promise you is I will give really crappy lectures the first week. Hopefully some people will drop because they'll be so disappointed. <laughs> and then you can sign up if you still want to. Um, but I mean, practically speaking, that means that like most of the people on those waiting lists will not be able to get in. Um, if you want to come to class, like we got plenty of chairs and frankly, half of you won't come anymore after this one. So, uh, so you could, certainly could come to the lectures and uh, we're going to have some discussion sections. You could probably come to those, but I can't have uh, papers graded and assignments graded and stuff if you're not enrolled. But after class, if you're not in the class, if you're on the waiting list and you want to come up and talk to me about that, we can do that after lecture. You're welcome to come and audit and hang out, even if you aren't officially enrolled. So I apologize. I would like to let everybody in, but that depends on having the staff to handle you properly, right, and help you and stuff. So um, that's the status of that. Uh, yeah, so let me just, I'm going to open up my course info handout. If you go to our website and you click syllabus, you'll get this handout. So um, here's a little info about the class and about me. I think this is always kind of the most boring part of every first lecture is where you go over all this stuff. So I'm going to try to kind of go fast. Uh, that's me, Marty Stepp. My email address is step at stanford.edu. My office is in Gates Building Room 195. Uh, a little bit about me, like I've been working here at Stanford since 2013. I mostly teach CS 106A and B, X. Uh, who here already had a class from me before? When you came back, wow. <laughs> you heard of Stockholm Syndrome? I'm going to look that up. <laughs> No, I'm happy to see all of you, uh, whether you had a class from me or not. Uh, yeah, this is a fun class. Uh, we're going to learn how to make Android apps. Uh, I'm not going to do this all by myself. We've got four awesome CAs. I think two or three of them are here. Who's here? Hi. Uh, can I put each of you on the spot for just a second where uh, instead of tell me your name, tell me your major, and tell me something random fact about yourself, maybe what you did over break or something that you're really into, something you've done recently. Is that, can we do that? Uh, maybe starting with Ashley, can you go first? Hi, I'm Ashley. Uh, I'm a CS undergrad, MS and Eco term. Um, random fact about me, um, I love teaching, so uh, I've taught classes before. I'm really hoping to help work with all of you. Ashley, do you want to tell them what you're going to do after this year? 
Yeah, I'm gonna work for Disney for ABC streaming. So like if you watch the Oscar streaming, that's my team. Watch ABC. I get like they send me mini maps. It's great. <laughs> What's Tony Stark really like? <laughs> no, you know, I got a kid, I got a little baby, 10 months old, uh, and so I'm gonna use this like Disney connection a lot over the next few, few years. Uh, Gracie, would you go next, please? Thanks. Hi, everyone, uh, my name's Gracie Young. I'm a co chair in computer science. Um, fun fact, I TA for this class a year or two ago, which was a lot of fun, so highly recommend this course. Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a second year master's in MSNE, and fun fact is that I followed Marty here from UW, where he did my undergrad. That's Although right. I never took a class with him there. That's, uh, yeah, see, she didn't know what she was getting into. Uh, <laughs> sorry about all that. Um, yeah, great. We also have Shreya, who's not here today, and you'll get to meet her later. Um, she's another one of our CAs, and she's got a lot of great energy, so I'm really happy to work with this awesome staff. Uh, their emails are here, their emails and their photos are also on the website. If you need to contact any of us, it's just right on the front page of the website. Uh, Sarah told me she's been getting a lot of email with questions, but nobody else told me that. I think it's because Sarah's listed first. She's only listed first because it's alphabetical order by last name. They're all sort of co-equal. We might set up like a staff email. We do have a Piazza for um, messages, but I haven't been really using it much yet. So uh, in terms of like reaching out to us, asking for help, you can email us or you can click on the link that says Piazza for a discussion forum where you can post questions and stuff. A lot of the questions people have on the first week are either like course administrative stuff like registration and waitlist, or it's like how to set up our software, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. But that's how to reach us. That's who we are. And uh, we haven't set our office hours yet, but we will start having them uh, next week. And in terms of if you want to talk to me in person this week, I will be available as, right after lecture if you want to come up to me or if you need to email me to find another time to talk to me, uh, usually before and after class, I'll be reachable in my office or here after the lecture is over. Uh, yeah, that's who we are. So um, anyway, the class, what I want from you, what I want prerequisite wise, is I want you to have equivalent of completed 106B. Um, that's not because I want you to know C++, it's not about the language. I just want you to know things like how to use different collections, like lists and maps uh, and sets. I want you to know, you know, maybe a little bit of recursion, a little bit of pointer type of stuff, just sort of programming muscle building that you would get out of 106B. That's helpful to be able to do the projects in this class. Um, it says on the, on the sheet here, it's helpful to have a background in Java. Um, strangely, we're not gonna use Java in this course. Uh, Android development used to be done in Java, but just a year or two ago, they switched to another language named Kotlin. I'm guessing nobody really knows. Does anybody here know Kotlin? couple of you. So like, uh, of course, I expect that you don't, right? So uh, we're going to learn this other language that you mostly haven't seen before. But it's actually very similar in many ways to Java. And its code basically compiles down into the same binary bytecode that Java compiles into. And it kind of interoperates with Java a lot. And so I think knowing Java is actually a super helpful starting point to learning this Kotlin language, because I can make comparisons between the two. Um, so but you don't have to be good at Java to do well in this class, but it could be helpful. Um, do you have to have an Android device to do this class? No. Um, it could be helpful, like if you want to run your code that you write on a real phone or a real tablet, you could do that. But you could certainly just do all the assignments on your computer using this emulator device. Uh, looks like this. You can run a little fake phone on your screen and test on that. And it works fine. You know, it's totally fine to do that. Um, plenty of you rich kids with your iPhones, you don't have to sell your iPhone or or beg your parents for another phone or whatever. Um, if you do want an Android device, but you don't currently have one, I will post a link later today to some cheapy tablet you could buy for like 50 bucks on Amazon that you could order if you just want to use a device for testing on a real device. It wouldn't cost very much. Um, I don't have any spares to loan out. Uh, I might see if I could order some, but I don't know if I have a budget for that. I'm, I'm not willing to like throw money at you guys. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you just look up what I get paid. You can still understand. Um, so. You, know, you don't need a device. If you have one, that's fine. It's optional. Um, so that's kind of what I, what I expect from you, what I need from you. Um, I would say, wait, why won't this go away? OK, there. Um, I would say, like, you know, I just mentioned a minute ago that 106B is helpful because you want to have the kind of programming muscles. I will say that when you go on to later courses like this one, it's a little bit less hand-holding than like 106A or, or B. Like you, you sort of, you get slides and you get an explanation of things, but then it's a little more up to you to kind of go explore. And uh, there's kind of a, a explosion of complexity where there's a million different libraries and widgets you could use. And sometimes that could be overwhelming compared to something like, uh, you know, a small confined topic like uh, using a vector in C++ where it's not as much to learn about. So it, 
I think one of the sort of meta skills that's good for you to have is just being able to get unstuck when you're stuck, being able to Google stuff, being able to try different things. Uh, we will certainly help you, but that's one of the reasons why I require B instead of A as a prereq is just because I think students get better at that sort of problem solving and debugging type of stuff when they have had a little more course, course uh, experience. Anyway, there's all kinds of different people in here. There's freshmen and sophomores who've just taken 106, and there's also you know, grad students who have taken a lot more courses. And my target audience is somebody who's just taken 106B or maybe one or two other classes. Uh, so I'm going to try not to target this at like really high-end, senior-level, computer science major type of students. Um, my intended sort of uh, difficulty level and workload here is meant to be a little relaxed like compared to 106 or 107 or something. It's meant to be kind of less than that. Um, I want it to work for you if you don't have a ton of time so that you can still pass or whatever. And if you want to do more, you get really into it, I want to give you some extra stuff. You can extend your projects and stuff as well. So hopefully this won't be your, your killer class um, this quarter. Has anybody taken the iPhone course 193P? Anybody taken that? No? Okay, well, uh, I was just going to say, if you have, my class is less hard than that. <laughs> Otherwise, their class is probably better than mine. But uh, my class is easier, which is probably what you actually want. Anyway, so uh, that's our class website. Everything I do, I'm going to post there. Slides and homeworks and just links and resources. So, you know, check that site pretty regularly. Um, our lectures are at this time in this room, which you already know that. Uh, you do not have to come to lecture. I'm not going to do a quiz or something, grade your attendance. I don't care if you come to lecture or not. You know, standard <coughs> old person warning, like if you don't come to class, you should really keep up. I think binging these, like binging two weeks of these and trying to do a problem is, is not a good way to do well in the class. But hey, like it's up to you. You figure it out. Um, we are going to have sections. Now, that might surprise you because this wasn't listed on the access system or simple enroll or whatever. Um, but that's a new thing we're doing this quarter. Uh, and I do want to give you participation points for going to those. Now, you haven't signed up for those yet. I'm going to have you fill out a form later this week when you tell me what times that you're available, and I'll match you into a section. Now, you might not want to go to that section. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to give you points, participation points for going and working on the problems each week. It'll be a little bit like a lab where we would want you to bring a device and you could, you could work on a laptop, work on some exercises with us. Um, if you don't want to go, the, what will happen there is like these points for these sections will add up to be worth equivalent of one of our homework assignments, okay, on the grading purposes. And if you don't go to any of them, like we're going to have a separate policy, which is that we will drop your lowest homework score. So if you don't go to any of these sections, that's going to be your lowest homework score, so it'll get dropped. But then that means every one of your actual homework projects has to be good, so you'll get a lot of points for those, you know what I mean? So uh, I think the better way to max out your grade would be to go to these and get these easy points just for showing up. And then if one of your homeworks is a little off, that one will be dropped and you'll get these points in place. You know, so I think that's a, the way to do it. But again, like if you truly can't go to any sections or you hate going to things because you're a young person, then uh, <laughs> hopefully there will be an option for people like that, okay? Uh, does that make sense? Do you have any question about, about that? Your grade? Okay, this is the part where uh, hopefully you'll like me after this part. Um, there's no midterm and there's no final. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. This moment represents the happiest you will be in this class this quarter. It is all downhill from here, except maybe during finals week you'll say, oh, thank God, I don't have a final for Marty's class. Um, so it's just basically your homework. And now this quarter uh, also it'll be going to your sections if you're doing that. So um, that's how your grade will be determined. The assignments are graded mostly on whether it works, but there's also a style component, like whether you use Android style well or, or use the proper idioms. We'll try to make it really clear on each assignment spec what we're looking for, what we're not looking for. Um, I would say in general, the grading is a little bit less picky and less uh, refined than like 106 grading. Um, but you know, we'll still look for certain things and we want you to do those things. And so hopefully it'll be clear what's expected. Um, I would say my intention here is that like pretty much everybody will pass the class unless they just don't turn stuff in. Like if you make an effort to do these assignments and you complete something that sort of works, and you turn it in and you do that for pretty much most of the quarter, you are going to pass this class. Like I'm going to set the sort of CD uh, threshold like very generously. Uh, you may not get an A plus, but you won't like get a D minus or something. You know either. So 
especially if you sign up for this as pass fail, like a CRNC, and you like turn stuff in, I can almost guarantee that you'll pass, okay? So I don't want you to feel like, man, you're gonna like flunk this class or something, okay? Um, regardless of if you percentage-wise what you get back as your score, as long as you like complete generally most of the assignments, you should be all right, okay? So yeah, if this is like your lowest priority course and you don't wanna do that much work, but you do wanna learn this stuff, you could take it pass fail, you're very likely to pass, okay? Um, we have late days for this class, just like a lot of the 106s where it's a little bit of slack, you could turn in some of the assignments a little bit late. A late date is 48 hours, so it's really a late pair of days, I guess, but um, uh, you have three of them for the quarter, so you could turn in three of your projects up to 48 hours late. Uh, if you're out of late days and you turn something in late, it'll be 10% penalty per day per 24 hours. Um, and no matter how many late days you have left, you have to turn the thing in no later than two days after original due date. So I guess that means you can only use one of these three late days per assignment. So anyway, that's kind of the policy here. Um, because we have this, it's very similar to the kind of general policy we usually 106 in, in here at Stanford. Because of this, this is fairly lenient, I would say. Because we have this, this is basically going to be what I do you know, if you get sick or something, I'm going to say use a late day. I'm not going to give you usually a special extension on top of this. Unless you truly become physically incapacitated for a long time or something. You know, this is basically your three of those pre-allocated, okay? So that should be fairly familiar if you took 106 here. Um, and the last thing is, uh, you know, honor code, like, we don't usually have a lot of problems with honor code in this class, but... Um, you know, in general, I don't want you to Google and copy the solutions on the web. I don't want you to turn in someone else's work. As long as you don't do that, I think we should be fine. Um, you're certainly allowed to talk to each other, and you're allowed to Google for concepts or Google for little snippets of code that are useful, but don't like Google for 193A homework solution and then download it from GitHub and turn it in. Don't do that, please. Um, yeah, and uh, we will, on, on some of the homeworks, we will allow you to work in pairs, so you certainly could work with that other person and and so forth. And I certainly don't want to scare you. Like you could talk to each other. You know, like some people feel like if you if you breathe on another student, <laughs> some sort of robot's going to come down and clutch, grab you in its clutches, and you get busted or something. That's just not how it works. Uh, I, I really haven't run into a lot. Like the kind of person who wants to do that usually just doesn't take this class because this class doesn't count for much of anything. So why would you take it if you're going to do that, right? So uh, yeah, that's the class policies. That's kind of more info about the class. Do you guys have any questions about the class before we? Move on. Yeah. So even if we preferred to do it in Java, we still should use Kotlin. Kotlin. Oh, that's an interesting question. Like, what if you would like to work in Java on the homework assignments? I hadn't really thought about that. It didn't occur to me that somebody would want to do that. Um, <laughs> someone wants Java when there is any other option? What? No, that's a reasonable question. Um, let me think about it. Uh, my initial instinct is to say that I would like you to use Kotlin just because the, the CAs, you know, it might be weird, like the, how do they grade you, how do they help you, what if you have a, a bug or an issue. But I mean, there's a lot of Android code out there, at various companies and various websites that is in Java. It's not wrong to code it in Java. So let me talk to CAs, let me think about it a little bit, I'll give you an answer back. Uh, I think for almost every student I would prefer for you to stick to Kotlin because that's what all the slides are going to have, that's what all my examples are going to have. I'm investing so much time to convert all my Java slides to Kotlin, you should use Kotlin. <coughs> but let me think about it. Yeah. Um, <coughs> any other questions? Yeah. How many homework assignments are there going to be in total? How many homeworks? I believe seven. So you'll have like maybe a week and a half for each one, or a week, a week plus a lecture, or something like that, roughly. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. How long are they supposed to take? How long should they take? Um, I don't know. For four or five hours? I don't know, Gracie, what do you think? How long do the homeworks take in this class? It kind of depends per student a lot. There's some students who get done in an hour, hour and a half, because they just like blaze through it, and I don't know, they just nail it. And then there's other students who, there's a weird compiler error, and they have to go to get help in the office hours, and it takes them 10 hours or something. But I, I would say whatever it took you to do like 106B, X homework, whatever it took you to do 107 homework, it's probably less than that, I'm guessing. Um, I can also, I have surveys from past quarters where I asked students how long it took them, but I don't remember what they answered. So I could go check and I could tell you what they said. Um, anything else? Okay, well. I don't like to mess around, so I want to like teach you how to do some stuff, you know. 
I don't get these people who are like, oh, it's the first day, so we're not going to do any coding or whatever. I just, that's not how I roll. Like, we're going to code. We're going to write some damn code. That's what's going to happen. Oh, but you know what I also want to do? I know you don't want to come to class, so I only have one thing I can do. I can't get you to come because of my amazing presentations or whatever. Um, but what I can do is I can show you pictures of my baby. <laughs> if you come to lecture, I'll show you pictures of my baby, and she's really cute. So that should be all it takes, right? Um, and I will show them usually uh, before I start recording the video so they can't see it if it's on the video. But today, as like a teaser, I will show it even on the video. Um, so here's my kid pulling my hair. Uh, that's my brother trying to stop her and my mom trying to stop her. There's a cameo of my cat, Mandy. Here she is with her walker. She's 10 months old. She's learning to walk, sort of. She doesn't know how to walk yet, but with this thing, she basically is even with my grandma in mobility now. <laughs> grandma has a cow just like that. Um, here's my cats. You don't care about them. Uh, here's me with her. I'm probably very tired. It looks like I'm having a tender moment, but I'm probably blacking out. Uh, here's her with two of my dogs. That's Barney and that's Abby, my French bulldog. Sometimes I'll show you pictures of them. They have a very tenuous relationship. She likes them a lot, and they aren't sure if they like her. <laughs> Because she basically walks up and just grabs tufts of their fur and tries to remove them. And so they're not sure if they like that, but I think they're figuring it out. Um, here she is today at daycare. So she looks a little mad for me to leave her, but don't worry, I'll go pick her up a little later. So yeah, I think that's all I got. Uh, that's a long time ago, but <laughs> um, this is a little more up-to-date photo. So now you've seen the whole spectrum of her. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, that's my baby. Her name's Eve. And uh, yeah, she's my whole life, and so uh, I'll definitely show you some cute pictures and videos of her if you come to class. Otherwise, you get nothing, get no baby. Okay, so um, yeah, that's, that's this class, that's what this class is. So let's get started. Um, if you go to the lecture part of the web page, it'll show kind of a calendar of what we're doing. Oh, these little files probably aren't supposed to be linked there, but um, the slides are all in the web page as well. And so um, I'm just gonna click this introduction here. So wait, where is that? Uh, introduction, okay, here we go. So yeah, what is this class? It's an intro to developing apps for Android. It's worth three units. Uh, compared to like 106, you know, we don't have a layer. We're gonna have office hours, but we're not gonna have like this big open lab with lots of people running around all the time the way that 106 does. So the amount of help you get is slightly less than in 106. I already mentioned the sort of things I want you to know about coming in, uh, 106B equivalent. Um, so what's Android? Well, you, you probably know what it is. It's a mobile operating system. It's made by Google. Uh, well, it wasn't originally made by Google. There was a smaller startup company that Google purchased, and then now Google owns and runs Android. It was originally made for phones, but now it runs on all kinds of devices like tablets and television sets and watches and microwaves and all kinds of crazy things. It was originally based on Java. Now it also supports this Kotlin language. The internals of most... Uh, uh, Android devices were based on Linux kernels for the underlying operating system. Um, technically speaking, Android is the world's number one operating system in terms of the number of devices that it is running on, which is pretty crazy. So, uh, but it also means maybe we should learn about it, right? Um, <laughs> and there, I haven't checked this figure in a while, but there's at least a million apps for Android, probably more like two million now. Um, Android is an open source operating system, sort of. Uh, Google releases the source code every other version of it. And so other developers can download it and look at the source. That's very cool. It's a real contrast with a lot of other operating system software. So Android's pretty neat. Um, why are we learning how to develop for Android? Well, there's lots of things you could learn. I'm convinced that um, you really want to learn in your, in your, if you're going to be a software developer, I think you should learn how to write real apps for a real platform that real people are using. So that could mean that you learn how to write web apps. Everybody uses a web, uses web browsers. Or it could be you learn how to write iPhone or mobile or Android apps, something like that. Or learn how to make desktop apps that run on an operating system like Windows or Mac OS or something. Like I think it's important to learn one of those. I don't know if it really matters which one, but I think that's valuable to learn about. Um, no, why would you choose Android over some of those other options that I listed? Well, you could just write a web page. I mean, strictly speaking, a web page can reach more people than an Android app. Every Android phone and device typically comes with a browser, so you could go to the web page in the browser. Same with other OSs, like you could run that same uh, web page on an iPhone, right? So why not write a website? Well, I mean, have you used the web browser on your phone? It's 
horrible, right? It's slow and everything looks wrong. And I mean, it's possible to write a web page that looks good on a phone, but it's hard and most people don't. And most users hate using the web browser on their phone. Uh, there's lots of surveys, lots of data proving that most, this is old, but like most people who want to use apps like about 85, 90% of the time, they don't want to open up your website on their phone. If they can help it, they would much rather install your app on the phone. So, I mean, why didn't we learn iPhone instead? Well, I mean, answer is fine. You can learn that too. I just, I don't know that. So <laughs> don't look at me. Like you could learn iPhone if you want. I'm not saying it sucks to learn iPhone. I just don't like Apple and I don't own any of their devices. Uh, so like I didn't, when I was gonna learn how to make a new course to teach you guys, I decided to pick the one that matched my phone and my tablet and the devices that I own. Part of the reason I own the devices that I do is because I really like how open Android is. And specifically, Android has a very low barrier to installing an app. Like if you guys in this class write an app, you can put that app into the app store pretty easily. They're likely to accept your app and then you really are in the Play Store. Or even if you don't get into the Play Store, you can put your app up somewhere on the web and you can send a link to your, your parents or your friend. They can go there and they can install your app on their phone. Even if it's just some silly app that you wrote, you don't need anybody's permission or approval to do that. That's kind of nice as opposed to like the Apple model is you have to submit it and they carefully look over all of it and verify it and you have to get passed through their quality checking to get into their store. There's pros and cons to that, right? Like if you're in the Apple store, maybe you have a little more confidence that the app is not a piece of crap or uh, hack your phone or malicious, you know, spying on you or something, right? Like you have a little more confidence in each app in the Apple store, but there's a lower barrier to entry in the Android store. So I like how easy it is for you to write an app and get somebody else to run it in Android. So that, that appeals to me. Uh, anyway, if you do want to learn iPhone, you can certainly do that. There's a class called 193P. I don't remember if it's offered this quarter or spring, but it's offered once or twice a year. Great class. I got nothing against that class. We're, we're all friends here, right? It's in spring. Um, it's in spring? Okay, great. So you can take that next quarter and come back and tell me how much better it was than this crap. So uh, <clears throat> how does Android work? Uh, well, <laughs> the operating system, hang on, I think I can make this bigger. Can't I make this bigger? There, that's better. Um, the operating system provides a lot of libraries for things like how to look up contact information for your, your friends, how to dial the phone, how to send a text, how to send a notification onto the screen, how to draw graphics, how to query data. A lot of that's kind of built into the operating system and then there are libraries in the editor you can use to access all those features of the device. So I'll teach you how to do some of those things, but a lot of it's kind of there built into it. And I don't want to go into all this stuff. I, frankly, I mean, don't make, don't get the wrong impression. Like I'm not some guru of Android. I mean, in theory I should be because I'm teaching this class, but <laughs> like there's just so much, you know, I, I've never written a, uh, an app that uses the location manager mixed with the telephony manager. I haven't done half of this Hello. stuff. I mean, I don't do that. I just, I know how to make like the snake game and a swipe right Tinder site. You know, like I know how to make, like, <laughs> I know how to do like four things and I'll teach you them, you know, but uh, I do think you could get overwhelmed by how much stuff there is here, but you don't need to know all of it. You just need to know certain things to accomplish certain goals, okay? <clears throat> um, Android has had a lot of versions over the years. Uh, the current version of Android is version nine, it's called Pi. They use these ascending letters like A, B, C, D up to up to letter P now, and they always name them after a treat or dessert or something like that. Uh, I don't, what are they gonna do for Q? Is there a dessert that starts with Q? I don't know. Quiche? That's no dessert. <laughs> By the way, I have to tell you, my, my brother, when he was like a, a, a adolescent or whatever, my big brother, we went to a restaurant and he's like, what's quitchy? <laughs> and to this day, we like, if we go to a restaurant and they serve keys, quiche, we're like, hey Dave, look, they got quitchy on the menu. Like, he's, he's in his 40s and we're still ripping him for something he did in his home. Um So yeah, hopefully they'll pick quitchy as the next one. But um, you might be interested, like if you have an Android phone, you might wonder like, what version does my phone have? Um, and you can find out, you can, uh, well, hang on, where is it? Here. So. Um, the thing is, even though I just told you all the, the latest version of the Android is 9.0, Pi, um, that's not necessarily what's on your phone. Because the way that upgrades work to the version of Android is, you know, Google makes it and then they package it up and then they release it. But when they release it, it doesn't beam it straight to your phone. It has to go then to the 
manufacturer of the phone. I have a Samsung phone, so Google sends the new version of Android to Samsung, and then if Samsung feels like it, they package it up for my specific model of phone, the Galaxy S7 or whatever I have. But if Samsung doesn't feel like doing that, then you're just fucked and you're stuck on, stuck on an old version. So I hate how this, like Google will make a new version, but you don't get to have it. Because Samsung doesn't feel like packaging it up for your phone. That might be because Samsung is lazy, like there might not be a lot of money in that for them. They already sold it to you, so why should they bother to post a new version of it, right? Or it might be that like it requires more horsepower and your old phone won't run very well on the new version, so they don't bother to pack that up. So like for example, just the other day my phone upgraded itself. I was like, oh great, I'm gonna be on Pi. But it upgraded me to 8.1 Oreo. So I guess I was on seven and it upgraded me here, but it just did it like two days ago. So like this came out in 2017. These Samsung people just got around to giving me my, my update. So I don't know if I'll ever get Pi. Um, here's a distribution of like what, uh, actually this is even slightly out of date I think, but like I think what I want you to take away from this graph is that most people have versions that are like, let's see, what's the 90% cutoff is like somewhere in here, 95, like in terms of like if you write an Android app, you have to decide how far backward compatible do you want to go. Because if you use features that just came into existence in Android 7, it won't run on somebody if they're f somebody's phone that runs Android 6 or 5 or 4. So if you target like version 4-ish, you'll be able to reach almost every phone in the world basically. And you'll find that most of the stuff that's been added to the platform since here is not stuff you'll need for our little dinky homework assignments that we give out. But you know, just letting you know, like if you want to use the latest, greatest features, some of them have backward compatibility, some of them don't. It won't affect our class very much, but I'm just saying this is an issue that comes up when you write Android apps. It's like what version of Android am I going to target? So anyway, there's a lot of these companies in the way between you getting these updates or not. Okay? And like sadly, you can't just go download it yourself and install it. I mean, it's possible to like root your phone and like hack into it so it's like free of the restraints that Samsung put on it or AT&T put. It's possible to do that, but it's kind of hard to do. And then even once you do that, it's kind of hard to get the new OS onto there. And so I do not condone such things, but it's up to you. I was curious, does anybody here have a rooted phone? Oh. A couple of hot shots in the room. <laughs> I rooted a phone once and I installed this like mod of Android called Cyanogen. And then the company like went out of business. So I'm like, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. I think they went out of business. Um, anyway, whatever. You could, you could Google that if you want. But so there, there are these different versions. I think mostly you don't have to worry about it, but just letting you know. It's an, it's an issue for some Android developers. Um, okay, so the software that you guys should use in this class is called Android Studio. It's an editor that Google's Android team uh, releases. It's basically a, uh, an enhanced version of another editor called IntelliJ IDEA. You ever use IntelliJ? Anybody ever use IntelliJ? Mm -hmm. It's a fairly popular Java editor. If you took 106A here, we don't use it. We use Eclipse, but it's an alternate. I think IntelliJ has now become more popular than Eclipse. I don't know. I think like that plus NetBeans are the two big Java editors. So they put a few new features and some new skins on top of IntelliJ, and they call it Android Studio and they put out a new version every so often. The current version is version 3.2, and that's what I have on my computer. I'm gonna show it to you in just a minute. So like, if you want something to do after class today, go download and try to install this software. I think it'd be good to do that soon because a decent fraction of you will run into trouble while you try to do this. In theory, it's not very hard to install. You just download it and decompress it and run the installation wizard and then you'll have it. But I find that with all the beautiful variety of computers that y'all have. Some of them just don't quite work with the installation and we have to fiddle with it and get it to work. We have a, a web page on the class website. Up here it says Android Studio. So if you click this, it describes some of the steps that you need to make to, to do to install this. I'm not gonna walk through it in great detail, but like go try to do this and get stuck and then contact us and we will help you. I think we're gonna run a session sometime soon in the evening. I haven't set a date. I'm going to meet with the CAs soon. We're going to have some kind of session where you could just like bring your laptop and we'll help you get it running. Um, but yeah, get, get started on that pretty soon. One thing, one thing about this Android Studio is like you download it and you install it, but then you find it wants to install more stuff. Like you load up a project and then it's like, oh, I need to install this component. Okay, install. You wait for that. Then you try to run the thing and it says, now I need to install this component. So like there's definitely like a, a victory of like actually getting an app to appear on a screen for the first time. Like when you actually get there, 
you're like, okay, now I finally installed this stupid thing. But um, it takes a little minute. There's like several gigabytes of stuff to download. You know, get, go to a place with good Wi-Fi or a fast connection or something and you know, set aside a few minutes to get that set up. Okay, anyway, that's Android Studio. Where am I? Here, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> do you have to use Android Studio? Yes, basically. I mean, if, if you don't, I can't help you. I mean, it's possible to install kind of a minimal tool set from the command line and then build your app on the command line and maybe you could use another editor. I really don't think you should do that. I mean, this is the editor pretty much everybody uses. I will teach you some features of the editor that I think will help you. It's a pretty good editor. I think the biggest problem with it is that it's a little bulky. If you have an older laptop, it could run a little bit slow. But uh, other than that, I think it's very featureful. And once you learn how to use it, it's pretty good. So I think you should just use this editor in general. Um, and it's free, of course. You don't have to pay any money. So go download that soon. Any questions about the, about the software? I'm not going to do a detailed tutorial of this whole editor, but as I work on projects for the course, I will show you some features of it and stuff. Um, here's just a quick sketch of what a project looks like. You, have, you always make a project in Android Studio. And a project has some XML files with settings, including a kind of main setting file called the Android Manifest. You normally don't need to edit that, but occasionally you do. Like if you're using certain hardware features, I'll tell you about later. There's a source folder that all your Kotlin and Java files go into. You normally don't have to go messing around in these folders because when you work in the editor, it'll make things in the right folders for you. But sometimes if you download something and add it to your project, you have to know where to put it. There's a directory called res, which is for resource files. There's lots of different kinds of resource files. You could have images that are called drawables. Um, you could have different GUI layout options in various directories. You can have different styles. So, you know, I'll teach you some of this later. But there's also a system built into Android Studio, which is called Gradle. Gradle is like a make file type of a thing that helps you build your source code into an app. Again, you mostly don't need to touch that, but it's there. As you build your project, it'll say running Gradle. That means it's kind of like compiling and building your app for you. So these are all things that you see. Frankly, I get a little overwhelmed. Like, wait, do I want to edit Gradle properties or Gradle wrapper properties? Or is it settings.gradle? Or is it local. I don't know. I just open them all until I find the thing I'm looking for and then I change it. You know, so I don't expect you to memorize all this stuff, right? Um, you have to set up an emulator, a virtual device, AVD. That's the little fake phone that runs on your computer that you test your projects on. I find that most of the installation problems people have are related to this. They get the editor installed, but then it won't install the virtual emulator. Um, you know, hopefully for most of you, when you do the installation, it'll also set up the emulator as just part of the install process. But for a few of you, it won't. There's some uh, steps about that in our installation guide, things that you can try to get it working. And that's where we come in. We can help you. But like getting the emulator to pop up where you see this on your screen and it seems to be like booting up, that's a big step in terms of getting this installed properly. Why would you use this versus a real device? Well, it's kind of easier. You don't have to carry around a USB cord and a phone or whatever. Um, it's, it can be slower than having a real device sometimes. You know, that's a, a drawback. And I think if you were ever going to really release an app, you would want to test on real devices so you could see how big the fonts look and how the UI feels to really touch. You know, because this thing, you touch it by like clicking stuff. So you're kind of simulating the person's finger. Or I guess if you have a touch screen, you can, you can touch it. But in general, you're faking with your mouse, you know. So yeah, you'll set that up. I've, I've got mine running. Uh, it really is like a full device. Like you could open up different apps and stuff. I don't know what music is on here, but it's basically a full phone, you know. I think I could go to CS, what, get started. No, I don't want to sign in. CS 193a.stanford.edu. Welcome to Chrome, no, uh, <laughs> no. See, I haven't used this. I just set it up for, for class. I wanted it to look like a new device. Then you can see, embarrassingly, the site does not look good on a phone. <laughs> oh, that's too bad, isn't it? Oh, well. Um, yeah, but like you can, you can play with this thing as if it were a real phone. It's kind of cool. So um, yeah, set up the virtual device. Uh, OK, those are all my slides about kind of intro to Android. Now I want to transition to like, let's actually learn how an app gets built, OK? Any questions before I move on to that? 
we won't be like building, I guess, like fancy stuff that like might need physical sensors, right? Like GPS or something. I, I doubt like an emulator could. Yeah, would you need fancy stuff like need special hardware like sensor? No, I mean that's one of the things about this class. Like, I'm gonna give you some basics, but if you have a cool idea for an app, it's probably the case that I'll get you most of the way there, and you can learn the rest. If it uses something fancy like phones tapping each other and beaming signals and using geolocation and stuff like. You'll either get a start toward that or you'll get close enough that you can Google the rest of the way. But we're not going to do anything too fancy schmancy. And I've kind of gone out of my way to pick homeworks that will be OK here. Because if it's based on GPS, it's kind of hard to test like walking around because this thing doesn't walk around. <laughs> you can fake it. You can tell it, pretend I'm in Reno right now. But it's like not easy to test movement and stuff. Yeah, so a lot of features that we use are going to just be kind of basic user interface type of stuff and network stuff. Yeah. Is there a list of topics? Uh, I don't know if I have one up, but I will post after class the whole like lecture calendar that I expect to use for the whole year. I just posted the first week so far because I was just getting ready for today. But I'll post like the calendar, and you can look ahead. And uh, it might change a little, but I'll give you kind of a sketch of what I expect to be doing. Okay? Yeah, great. Any other questions? Okay, let's see if we can. Learn some, some details here. Uh, creating a first Android app. I don't know if we'll totally finish an app today, but I'm going to try to write a sort of basic app with you guys. <coughs> so here's what I want to write with you. This is my first example I always show in this class. Uh, I call it the bigger number game. It's a stupid thing that you would never really want, but you know it has to be simple. It's either this or a fart app. And uh, after the last few years, I changed it to this. No, <laughs> no, it was never the Ford app. Um, so here's what I want to build with you guys. An app that pops up two buttons, and then two buttons have numbers on them. And you have to click the button that has the bigger number. And if you do, you get a point. And if you're wrong, I don't know, you lose a point or you don't get a point or something. And my joke is like, this is the Berkeley admissions app. <laughs> if you can get to a score of three, you're in. You know, uh, I don't know, whatever. So that's what I want to build, OK? Really dumb, but I, just want, I want something simple. So to do that, I need to learn like, how do I make all these different widgets show up on the screen? How do I position them? How do I make it so that when you click on something, it'll do something in response to that? Like, eh, it seems like a starting point, right? OK. So let's make a new project. In Android Studio, I'm going to do this kind of fast, but again, it's on video. So you tell it you want to make a new project. Make sure to tell it that you're going to use Kotlin, unless you're him, you want to use Kotlin. Um, <laughs> you mostly don't have to change any settings along the way, except you might want to give your project a descriptive name as opposed to the default name. Uh, so l let's walk through that real quick. I'm going to go to Android Studio. And it just opens up with this like welcome screen. I'll say, start a new project. What do I want to call it? Let's call it like Berkeley or something. I don't know. Um, most of this stuff doesn't really matter. You can change the folder if you want. I'll just leave it. Now here, include Kotlin support. For some reason, I think on a lot of systems, that's not checked by default. So please check that. You don't want C++ support, I don't think. So click Next. It asks some questions like, is this going to run on a TV or a watch or something? You don't need to mess with that. This is the default phone. And it's like, what? remember we talked about the different versions? It asks you what version do you want to target. I'm pretty sure I didn't change this. It's set to Android 4. You don't need to change it. You just leave it on the default setting. Say next. And then it asks, like, what kind of look do you want to start with? Is it a mapping app? Is it a, I don't know, a login app? What kind of thing is it? I'm just going to say empty. That's kind of the default. It'll give us an empty screen to play with. It says activity. I haven't told you what that means. But an activity is basically a screen of, of UI in an Android app. So. I'll say empty. And then it asks me a few more questions about my names of things. I'll just leave it for now. It's default. That's fine. Finish. And it starts to load up. And I think you'll find that when you first load things up, it just it takes a little while. You might find your computer takes even longer. I've got Linux, and the Linux version seems to run kind of snappy, kind of fast, and the Windows one's kind of slow. I don't know. It just takes a little longer on a lot of systems. So. Normally, when I show up for class, I'm going to have the project already open because I don't want to wait for all this stuff, you know. But when you first make a project, you kind of have to wait. This is that Gradle system setting up the build for the, for the project. It's one of the slowest builds I've ever <laughs> worked with for an empty project. It's still working. I think when it's ready, it'll show the screen in the main pane here. Bless you. 
Okay, I think, is it done? Is it loaded? See, I've got an app here. I've got a little bit of code. I don't really know what else to do yet. Let me come back. I'm not gonna play with the editor anymore for the moment. Go back to here. So I make a new project. So let me tell you some terms. I mentioned an activity is like a screen of user interface content. Every Android app has an activity or one or more activities, one or more screens. Within an activity, you have these little widgets like buttons or text fields or whatever. Those are called widgets or they're called views. Those are sort of interchangeable terms in Android. Uh, you have to tell the app how to position things. Where should they be located on the screen? Do they grow or shrink or do they scroll? That sort of stuff collectively is called the layout of the activity. So I'll teach you a little bit today about how to do layout. And we also have, you know, when you click on stuff or scroll or swipe stuff, that's called an event. That's you interacting with the app or some external force interacting with the app. If network data arrives, that might also be an event. Or if a timer goes off, that could be an event. There's lots of different kinds of events. Um, there's some different bars and system things that we might talk about sometimes. Like you have these notifications up in the top and you have actions that can be near those. I think that top bar is action bar. So anyway, we'll, we'll revisit some of these things as we go along. But mostly I just want you to know you make an activity and you put widgets inside of it, okay? Um, here are some of the different kinds of widgets. I guess it scrolls off the screen a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to teach you all of them today. I'm pra practically not going to teach you, you know, even half of them in the course. But I think if you learn a few of them, you can kind of figure out some of the rest. Uh, I want to use stuff like buttons today and uh, showing text is called a text view. So I'm going to take two or three of these different kind of widgets today to start with. How do you do a UI? Well, kind of interesting. Like you can draw it visually and drag and drop things to set up the UI in Android Studio. So that's not always how you do it. Sometimes you write in the code manually for the UI, but just for starters, for noobs like most of us, uh, this is actually a very nice thing. You can just sort of drag and drop and stretch and squeeze and type and watch the UI uh, appear the way that you want it to appear just by making that. It's almost like a little doodler for the UI. And as you work on that, it's saving all that information into a file called an XML file. So I'll show you right now. Uh, remember that we're writing this Berkeley guessing game, right? So it needs to have some text here that says number guessing game is sort of in the top middle. So how you could do that is you go back to your project and up here you have these two bars of content. One of them is this XML file and the second one is a KT file. So you might guess KT is a Kotlin code file. And the .xml file is sort of a description of the layout. So you got the one file is like where are the widgets located, what kind of widgets are they, where are they positioned, how big are they. That's the XML file, the layout file. And then the other file is like what do they do when you click on them, the sort of event processing. That's done in Kotlin. So you have the separation of those two things. That's how Android does it. Um, you, you know, this is like how they chose to design Android. Uh, you could design a system where all of that was done in code in the KT file. That would also be fine. But they felt it was easier if you did it with this separation, with this split. I know the font is too small. I'll make it bigger in just a second. Um, so let's go to the XML file, the layout, first. So there's a default view here of this file called the design view where you can pick different widgets and drag and drop them on the screen. By default, there is a text view widget here that says, hello world. And if you click on it, it kind of shows these alignment thingies. And I mean, I'm, I'm going to teach you more how this works as we go along. But even with nothing else here, I'm pretty sure I can run this. Up in the top, there's a play button to run the app. If I click it, it says, what device, what a virtual emulator device do you want to run this on? Now, I've got two or three of them because I set up one that's like a tablet real big and one of them that's real little. I set up a couple different ones. You probably only need one virtual device that the editor should set up for you when you install it. So I'm going to tell it to use this first one here. And I'm going to say, just keep using that device every time I run the app. Just always use that device. So now what it's going to do is it's down here, it's going to build for a few seconds. And then when it's done building, it's going to sort of beam the app over here. And if it worked, it'll pop up on this emulator device here. And it's not going to do very much because I didn't change anything. But at least I should get this app popping up and it should say hello world on the screen. So first time you run it, it takes a little longer. So again, like most lectures, I will do that before class. I'll get the app launched before I show up. But I want you to feel the pain in real time with me this first time. You know what's really sad? 
they've been continually improving the speed of this over the years. This is much faster than it was two years ago. Yes, it says hello world. So we have a running app here. Um, but yeah, it used to be even worse. Whatever your thoughts of the performance of this are, it used to be worse. So if I want different widgets on the screen, I basically just pick them from the left palette and drag them and drop them on the screen. The only part of that that's tricky is that the positioning <coughs> system is a little weird. I'm going to mostly explain it to you by example today. And then I'll actually teach you how it works as we go forward. But it's just like, you know, I can't cover everything all in one lecture, right? So if I go back to the slides and I go to the app that we're trying to make, the bigger number game. So, I mean, it doesn't have to match perfectly, but oops, what is happening here? Uh, sorry, I was trying to make the font real big so I could see it. There. So let's just try to get as many of these things on the screen as we can. It says bigger number game. So that text is, I, I have another slide that showed all the different widgets. If you just want some text that displays, that's called a text view. So if I go back here, if I want a text view, it has this palette of different widgets and they're categorized by different things. You can choose common, these are the most common things. You can say text, it'll show ones that are related to text. I'll, I'll grab text view. I click and hold and drag and drop here. And I'll just put it somewhere near the top. And it says text view. <laughs> so now that I dropped this here, I can configure it. I can change some settings about it. So over here on the right, there's this like properties pane of different aspects of this widget. The text of the widget is an important property. The default is text view. That's not what I want. I want it to say number guessing game exclamation enter. And now see how it updated here, right? Kind of cool, right? Visual editor. Of course, it's kind of off center. Bless you. So I, like, I find this kind of hard to navigate, but what you're supposed to do is like, I want the top middle of this to be sort of locked into the top middle of the screen. Do you understand? So you sort of grab here and you go, and then it, <laughs> well, didn't quite do it, but yeah, something like that. You just sort of like, the way the layout engine works is you sort of attach things to things. It's called a constraint-based layout. I'm not gonna like really do a lot with it today, but that's kind of the idea. Um, so now if you look at the screen here, it's sort of a bigger font here. Uh, I don't think the text quite matches, but it, it's supposed to be a bigger font. So like, how do you do that? Well, I mean, if you just look through these properties, eventually you'll find a oh, text size 14 SP. That means 14 scaling pixels. Oops, what just happened? Sorry, click on it again. Uh, so maybe instead of 14 SPs, I'll say 20 SPs. Now it's bigger, you know. Um, it didn't really center. I always forget how to like line these up. But you line up, you attach to there. They just added this stupid thing, so it's hard for me to get it to work. Okay, so that's sort of in the top center. And then underneath that it says, press the button of the larger number, blah, blah, blah. So I'll just make another text view. Okay, I'll drag you down here. And I'll say, uh, you know, press the button and earn a point if you want to get into Berkeley, whatever. Enter. I just want it to be longer than a single line. Lol, but why would you? And I just want it to be more text. So this thing, like by contrast to the thing above here, this one kind of expands to be as wide as the screen and it's kind of underneath the first one. So like basically how you do that is you say, um, I want his left edge locked into the left edge of the screen and I want his, I can't even see the right edge, his right edge locked into the right edge of the screen. Ugh, I can't get it, come on. So I just, I feel like this thing kind of sucks, honestly. Um, you go, okay, whatever, can I? Ugh. Well, I want the bottom of this to lock to that. So it's like these guys, like if I ever moved this guy, it would move him with it. You know what I mean? Like now they're kind of linked to each other. So you sort of like attach corners to corners of things. So now that's under there. Um, there's supposed to be two buttons. So those are called button. So if I go back to common or if I click on buttons, there's button here. So I drag a button over and the text of the button, these are gonna have numbers on them and you pick the bigger number. Maybe I'll just start out by typing zero, like that's the initial number. Um, I'll drag another button over here and I'll say his text is also zero, okay? 
And then I think down at the bottom, there was one last text view that said how many points you have. Maybe as we play the game, we'll update that text, you know. So points zero. I'll drag this text view down here. And there I'll say points zero. Fine. Now, um, even though everything looks OK, it'll get mad at me unless I anchor everything properly. Like this guy, I really need to grab his thing, anchor him to the edge like that. You see, I, I click and drag to the edge and let go. And the fact that he's filled in, that means he's like anchored properly. Um, and this guy here, I need to anchor him to the bottom here until that turns blue. And then even more than that, like you have to anchor everything vertically and horizontally or else it gets confused. So like this guy, I sort of want him halfway between here and here. So you like anchor his top to there. But no, I don't want him to go to the top. So I also anchor his bottom to there. And now he's in the middle. You know, now it's like springy and that's stupid stuff. I don't know. But... <laughs> Like I don't, mostly when I write apps, I don't drag and drop like this. I just go to the edit. You can type this in and it'll be equivalent. And so mostly that's what I do. But I'm trying to show you like first app ever, you would mostly want to just type like this, right? So I think I'm pretty good. I think this guy also needs to be anchored to these two edges so that he will be centered. I don't know if this guy got centered properly. Because like I anchored his part there, but then I want the other side to be anchored to there. Uh, so I want them both to be blue. Like I can't see the, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think he's working. We'll see. Um, so yeah, you get all these guys attached to everything. And I think I can run it. If I'm missing something, it'll tell me like you didn't anchor your stuff properly. Or when you run it, it'll look weird. But you kind of want to set up all your widgets and then run it and see if it looks okay, you know? So I'll go back here and wait for my app to pop up on the screen again. So far, any questions about kind of like doodling a UI in this thing? Yeah. Is the only place you can edit the text that little box on the side? So, I mean, I'll show you this as we go on, but like all the stuff we're editing over here, really what it ends up doing is modifying the contents of an XML file. So like if I zoom this in a little bit, like all of this stuff is here because of my dragging and dropping that I did in that visual editor a minute ago. And so if you want to change any of these properties, you could also just go into this XML file and change them. So this is more what I really do when I edit an Android app. So sometimes I can't remember like which little draggy droppy thing do you drag because I don't do the dragging, you know? Um, so actually sometimes if it doesn't look, did you see when I ran it, it wasn't aligned very good, you know? Like, so why does it look different there than then it looked here. Like I don't think I had this anchored perfect. Like I think these didn't anchor. So I, I think I think you have to, um, you know, drag this to here. I don't think I did that before. And then I have to drag this to here. And now it's actually centered. You know, like that. You have to do that kind of stuff to get this to work. Okay. But I pretty much have the UI looking the way I want. But uh, if I go back to the emulator and I tap on these buttons, nothing happens. So let's do that. How do you make it so that something happens when you click on a button? Let me show you. Uh, wait, how do I get rid of that? Go away. There. So let's talk about making things happen when you click on them. That's called an event. If you did 106A or something, you probably did a little bit of events when you click on Java GUI apps, like a mouse click event or a key press event. That's a user or some force acting on your app and you want to respond to it, right? So we want to learn how to respond to clicking events. Um, and most of the code of an Android app is what you would call event-driven code. You don't really have a main function or main method that runs. You just have little functions that execute in response to events. And you have to think about what functions you want to respond to what events. And that constitutes the code of your app, basically. Event-driven GUI programming, okay? So I have to teach you the code to write a function or a method that will respond to an event. So we write a function. And then we have to tell the app, when you click this button, I want you to call this function. We have to like connect the event handling function to the widget. Okay? This is where Kotlin starts to come in. So, um, <laughs> so now we can talk about Kotlin for a minute. Um, this is my first time teaching the class in which we're using Kotlin. So I'm trying to figure out how to approach it properly because I can't give you like a full tutorial of this language, right? Like I don't have a lot of time left here. So. Let me give you a like really fast Kotlin introduction here. I have, these slides are all on the website. This will be unsatisfyingly brief. 
Um, it's a relatively new programming language made by the same people who made the Android Studio uh, IntelliJ uh, editor, JetBrains company. And it was made to be a sort of faster, cleaner, simpler language for development than Java. But one interesting thing about the language is that when it compiles, it turns into .class files, which is the binary format used by Java. So this language like very nicely interoperates with Java, and it can run with Java code together very seamlessly. And that's neat because this makes it very backward compatible. Like you can, you can write, if you already have a Java app, you can write some new parts in Kotlin and they can still talk to the old parts and it all kind of works together. Well, you were asking about can you use Java? A lot of apps have a mix, which is interesting. So these languages do, do kind of work together well. Um, this is now the default language that Google wants you to develop in for Android. So they have gone in the last year or so, redone all of their tutorials and all their instructions to have Kotlin code samples rather than Java. Although I think they have a switch you can flip to see the Java version as well. So here are some specific things that how to do it in Java followed by how to do it in Kotlin. So I guess I'm implicitly assuming that you know Java here, but you don't have to. Maybe both of these are new to you. That's fine, but I'm just I'm going to show you some Kotlin stuff, okay? In Java, when you want to print things to the console, you can say system out print lane with semicolon. In Kotlin, you just say print lane. Kotlin does not need semicolons after statements. I would say just in general, Kotlin looks to me like a little bit of a mix between JavaScript and Python, in which you can see they're nice or scary depending on your perspective. <laughs> so, but you're learning some other stuff from this slide too, right? Look, I taught you how to do a comment. Uh -huh. I also taught you that you use parentheses to pass parameters when you call functions and that strings are in quotation marks, right? You just learned that from this slide. Uh, <clears throat> variables are a little different. Instead of saying like int i equals 10, you say var i equals 10. So you didn't say the type, notice that? It figures out that the type is int because the value that you're storing there is an int. It's not that this variable doesn't have a type. It's that you just didn't have to say the type in your code. It is an int, and if you try to do stuff to it that a string would want to do, it won't work. You know, like it does have a type, it's just you don't say the type. If you really want to say the type, you can after a colon, but it's essentially unnecessary, optional to do so. There are some situations where putting the type in is helpful to the compiler to remove ambiguity, but mostly you just don't say types of things as much. Um, there's confusingly two ways to declare a variable. You can either say var or val. And var is like a normal variable, and val is like a constant that you can't change it once you declare it. This is going to be 4.50 forever. This one you can change from 10 to 30 or whatever. Which one's better? Well, I mean, you know, the recommendation of the language designer is to use val as much as you can because it avoids certain kinds of bugs from accidentally changing your variable, but to use var when val won't do. You can do whatever you want. I don't really care. But those are the two ways to declare variables in Kotlin code. Okay. Uh, okay. Here's some of the types. Java has like booleans and cares and doubles and ints and longs and strings. Most of those same types are here, except they're all capitalized. Fine. A lot of the rules are the same, how they work and stuff. Uh, Conversion is a little different. In Java, you can do type casting or other ways of conversion, conversion between types. In Kotlin, usually you say the value dot to the type that you want to convert it into, and it'll, it'll return like this double rounded to an int or truncated this int upgraded to a double, et cetera. There's also a to int function on strings and stuff like that. Yeah. Does that mean that the primitive types and the wrapper classes are just like the same thing in Kotlin now? Yeah, technically what this means, like Java has these like primitives like int and double, and it has these wrapper classes with capital letters like integer and capital D double. I don't know if you encountered that or not in your 106A, but like that's a thing that you have to think about a little bit in Java. In Kotlin, they just remove that distinction. Everything in Kotlin is an object, including primitive values like these. And all the types are capital, including the sort of primitive basic types like these. Um, we, we end at 250, right? Isn't that true? 245? What, when do we end? 250? OK. I won't keep you late, but I'll usually try to give you what I can in the time we have. So strings, that's Java strings. You declare them. You can concatenate them with plus. You can call methods on them, like substring. Uh, Kotlin, pretty similar, but it has this cool syntax where if you put a dollar sign and then a variable name, it will inject the value of that variable here, and you don't have to use the quote plus, quote plus, quote kind of stuff like in the Java example. That's cute. You don't have to do that. The plus thing still works. 
but this is cleaner sometimes. Um, you can also put dollar plus some bracketed complicated expression and it will run that expression and stick its value result in there if you do that. Um, you can also do multi-line strings where you, you start with a triple quote and then you put lots of text and then you end with a triple quote and sometimes called a here doc, I think. And you, anyway, you, you can do multi-line strings. Mostly the string stuff is the same as Java. The method names are the same. and So that's not too tough. Um, loops. You can mostly do the same kind of loops as Java, but most people do these little bit briefer loops. Like if you just want to do something a certain number of times, you could do what's called a repeat loop, repeat this 10 times. If you want to loop over the indexes and you want to refer to each index, you can say for each i in the range of 0 to 10, you can go down, or you can go up by 2 instead of, you know, instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, this will be like 1, 3, 5, 7. You can go from 10 down to 0 by negative 1. So this will go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Um, you can for each loop over a collection, you can for each loop over a map, the keys and the values, the indexes and the elements. So there's a lot of different ways to do looping. Pretty similar to Java, but just a little bit, a little bit cleaner. Um, if you want collections of things, here's how to do it. Instead of making an array or an array list, you can say that you want a list of ints, and you say list of, and you write the values, and you can add and remove things from lists. You can access the elements of lists with brackets. So I'm trying to give you a taste of the language. I'm not, I don't expect you to like remember all this right now, but I'm just trying to give you a taste of this language. I, I want to show you functions, and then I'm going to go back to my app that we're working on. Okay. So let's talk about where functions. In Kotlin, or excuse me, in Java, this is a, a method, right? You say public, and then the return type, and then the method name, and the parameters go in parentheses do some stuff, you return something, whatever. Or you could have another method that calls that method. And so here's, here's some examples of methods and calling methods in Java, right? In Kotlin, you just say fun. Functions are fun in Kotlin, right? <laughs> um, you say the name of the function, the parameters have the name with a colon and the type afterward. The return type is at the very end of the header, colon int, that means the function returns an int right there. And then you just write whatever you know, value of whatever code inside of the function. So that's kind of the general syntax for a function in Kotlin. Okay. I know I'm just throwing you a lot of stuff here, but look, let's jump back for a second to this app that we're trying to write. I want to make it so that when you click on buttons, something will happen. So let's talk about how you do that. You go back to your code here, and you click on the button that's of interest. And now in here under the properties, there's a property called on click. So if you do any web dev or something, you might know that name on click. It's like, what do we want to do every time that they click this button? In this box, you can type the name of a function that you want to run. So you can do this in either order. Like you have to write that function and then you have to tell the layout to call that function. So maybe what I'll do first is I'll go to the Kotlin file for my, for my app, for my activity here. Now it's got some code in here and like, I frankly, I just want to talk about <laughs> what does this stuff do? I'll talk about this later. But what you need to do is, inside of your class for your, for your project, you need to write a new function that will be called when you click on the button. So like maybe I'll call it fun left button click. The function has to accept a single parameter named v of type view. Uh, it could be called whatever. It could be called view or something. View is the super class for all of the different widgets, like buttons and text boxes writing a function that accepts a view parameter. It's red because it doesn't know what that is. So uh, that means I need to import the view library. In uh, Android Studio, I think you can, it, if you hover on it, it says, uh, it should say there, it says, do you mean android.whatever.view? Press Alt-Enter. If I press Alt-Enter, it like imports that for me. It's kind of cool. So now it doesn't, it's not mad at me anymore. So now that I have this function, I haven't done anything in there yet, but now that I have that function, if I go back to this XML file and I click on this button and I say, hey, on click, I want to call the left button click function. See that? So I choose that or type that in, and now it will run that function when they click on that button. And I can do the same thing for the right button. I probably want to do different things. Would you click on each of those two buttons? I'll write one called right button click. It takes a view parameter. And over here, when they click on the right button, 
I want to run the right button click function. Okay. So now that's all wired up, except they don't do anything. So what do I want them to do? Well, remember the point of this app was that um, the buttons are supposed to show. By the way, I don't I don't actually know why. Why is there like a evil dark version of the app over here? I actually don't know what that is. Uh, maybe it did go to dark mode or something. I, I don't know. It's some sort of Thanos thing where like one of them will break apart or something. I don't know. Um, but remember, I want these two buttons to have randomly drawn numbers on them. And I want you to click the one that has a bigger number, right? So actually, there's a little bit more going on here where I do want a way to make the buttons have randomly chosen numbers on them. I haven't written any code to do that yet. So how do I do that? Well, let's talk about that. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to my slides for the first app. So where is it? Where is it? So OK, here. If in your code, in your Kotlin code, if you want to talk to one of the widgets in your app, you can use a method called find view by ID. You can give each of your widgets a unique <coughs> ID, a unique name, and then that allows your code to refer to that widget. And then you can say stuff that you want to do to the widget, like change a text to this, change a color to that. So you can interact with the widgets in Kotlin using this find view by ID function. But in order to do that, you should give your widgets IDs to refer to. So let me show you how to do that. If you go back here and you click on this button, it says ID button. And then if I click on this one, it says ID button two. It just auto made those because it didn't know what to name them. So it made a default name. Let's use a better name like left button or whatever. And then this one here, let's say right button. Okay. Now in the code, if I want to change something about the button, I can say val left button equals find fiend find find view by id in brackets it wants to know what type of widget that will be it'll be a button and now it doesn't know what a button is but if i press alt enter it imports button the library of button and now in these parentheses i tell it what id number of what widget i want to talk to so if i say r dot id dot left button you always start with r.id. R means resource. R. You say rid left button. This variable is talking to that widget. So I could do something like left button dot. Now all these different properties pop up. If I say like text equals booyah, that will modify the button to say that text on it. That's not what we're trying to do, but like I'm just trying to show you this is an example of using an event to make some change that you'll see on the screen. Okay. But we need to kind of do something kind of like this, kind of similar to this, but we need to make it pick random numbers and stuff, right? So I told it to run. Uh, is it still compiling? Booyah, there, see? So I made it do something when you click on the left button. How about instead of booyah, I make it pick random numbers for both of the buttons? So how do you get a random number? Well, it turns out it's the same as Java. So if you say like val r equals random, that's a new random number generator object. I press alt enter to import it. It's Java util random, that's fine. If you want a random number, you say something like val num equals r dot next int. And then you want a next int that's up to 10 maybe, but no more than 10. So that's a random number. If I want this button text to display that random number, I can just say dollar num. So that converted num to a string. Okay, so now when I click the left button, it'll put random text, a random number as the text of the left button, right? I also want to do that to the right button. So maybe I'll do val right button is the find view by ID of right button. And so maybe maybe this is num one. I set you to num one. And I set a new random number for the right button to be num2. Do you see like this code collectively sets both of the buttons to have random numbers on them, right? Now, the only problem is I don't want to do this just when they tap on the left button, right? When do I want to pick these random numbers? Either time and when it starts. When the app starts, I want there to already be random numbers. 
And every time they click, whether they're right or they're wrong, after that I need to pick new random numbers, right? So there's multiple places during the lifetime of this app where I'm going to want to pick these random numbers. So I think this would make a good helping function that I call from multiple places, right? So let's take this code and yank it out and call it uh, fun pick random numbers. I don't need to accept a view parameter here. So there, that's how to pick random numbers. Now you guys said I need to do that when the app first loads up. Well, how do I run code when the app first loads up? There's a method that comes for free when you first make your code called onCreate. When your activity is created, when your app is being loaded up, this function gets called. I don't really want to talk about some of this stuff. What's a saved instance bundle? Don't worry about it. Just wait. Give me a few days. I'll tell you. But like in here, if you want some code that will run when the app loads up, you can put it in here. So in here, I could say pick random numbers. So now when the app loads up, random numbers will be on those fields, okay, on the buttons. So now when you actually click on the buttons, I need to see if you pick the right one, pick the one that was bigger, right? So how do we do that? Well, I need to know what numbers are on each of the two buttons. So to do that, I could again ask for these two buttons. I want these objects so I can talk to them, you know? If I want the numbers that are on there, if I say val left num equals, how do you suppose I find out what number is on that button? Yeah? Left button dot text dot. So now I would say to int, but it's not there. That's because this thing is dumb. You have to say to string first, then dot to <laughs> int. It's like, come on, guys, so close, right? Why do I have to convert it to a string first? I'll tell you later. Uh, the left num is that. The right num is that. Is the right buttons version. So now I got these two numbers, and I want to see which one's bigger. Well, if you click the left button, then I'm hoping the left num is the bigger one. That would mean that you're correct, right? So um, if left num is greater than right num, you win, or you get a point, or whatever, right? Else you lose. Um, so what do I do here? Well. There's some notion that this app keeps like score, like it says uh, points zero, points one, points two. How do you suppose I keep track of points that will kind of live on for a long time? Where would we normally do that in like a 106A or type of a program? Like an instance variable, a field? Yeah, you can do that here. You can say like var points equals zero. This is like a private, you know, you can say private var if you want to. That's like an instance variable. It lives through the lifetime of this object. It's coming like a global value. Points zero. So like you start with no points. If the left one's bigger, that's good. That means you get more points, right? So I'll say points plus plus. By the way, we talked about how you could say val and you can say var. If this had been val points, it doesn't like it if you try to plus plus down here because it's like read only, right? So I don't want to say val. I want to say var. Um, if you get it right, you get a point. If you get it wrong, I don't know, maybe you lose a point or something. Maybe points minus minus. We're almost out of time. How do I show how many points you have on the screen? Just me changing this variable, you won't see that variable on screen anywhere unless I tell you to, right? So how do you see the change? Set the text, set the text of, there's a label down at the bottom here, a text view called text view three. Maybe I'll call it points view or something, or just points, points is fine. Uh, oops, update usage as well. Okay, whatever, sure. Um, I'm almost out of time, but I think we can get this done. So points plus plus, I think what you would do here is you'd say find view, fiend view, find view by id, r.id.points, and then set his, oh, that should be find view by id. It's a text view. And then set his dot text to be points colon dollar points. So update his text on the screen whenever you click these buttons. Now I only did it for the left button, not the right button, but I think you get the idea. Maybe if it works here, we will be out of time and then I'll finish sort of right on time here. Uh, and then since you don't go to Berkeley, you'll be able to extrapolate what the right button code would look like. Um, ready for this? If this works, I'm a ninja. Uh, eight is bigger than two, right? So I'm gonna click on this button. 
Hooray, I have one point. Uh-oh, wait. Two, three, four, uh-oh. <laughs> what am I missing? I should call my pick random numbers right at the end of here to pick new numbers. But anyway, that's our first app. That's our first lecture. Thanks. I'll see you Thursday. Get Android Studio set up.